than he yesterday. Steph Curry spoke for the first time about the addition of CP3. Every team that CP's been on, you know, they've gotten better. Um, and I think that's the most consistent thing about him and who he is and what he brings to the team. And everybody's going to talk about the age and all that type of stuff. So it's on us to, to put it all together and figure out how the pieces work. Okay, so that was Steph's talk. Now, listen, Clay Thompson called it weird when they asked him about the addition. So, is this dynasty <laughs> over when we're talking about Golden State, especially with the addition of uh, Chris Paul? Wendy? Well, if they're bringing Draymond Green back, they are a, definitely a championships caliber team. Uh, I know if you could make the argument that their ceiling has been lowered a little bit because without Jordan Poole, they don't have the same overall firepower that they did when they won the title uh, last year. And they're probably going to lose Dante DiVincenzo, who opted out of his contract yesterday and is probably going to be looking for more money elsewhere. But when you still have Steph Curry, still putting up prime numbers, you have Draymond Green, you have Andrew Wiggins, who's found a terrific role there. You have Klay Thompson, who I agree is not the player he was before the injuries, but still has terrific firepower. You are talking about an awesome team. They were in sixth seed last year because Steph got hurt. Twice he missed stretches during the season. They weren't in the sixth seed because there were five teams better than them in the Western Conference. Denver is obviously going to come back as the favorite, but if you count them out, I don't think that you're looking at it fairly. Okay, so I'm thinking, Jay, when you bring in Chris Paul, I'm like, you got Steph Curry there as your point. How is this going to work? And, and is this dynasty? Is, is it just as strong? Is it over when you bring in Chris Paul? See, I would slightly disagree with Wendy here. I don't think that the ceiling has lowered. I think the ceiling has slightly elevated, high, like slightly. Now, mm. there's still some defensive challenges to when CP3 and Steph play together because it's a smaller backcourt if you're going into closing minutes. But, you know, I look at how these guys actually complement each other. If you're looking at Golden State, one of the last teams in the league, at their usage rate of pick and rolls, right? Now, you saw a higher usage rate during the playoffs when they found out that against Sacramento, right, obviously Steph Curry involved in a ton of pick and rolls. Well, the usage rate for pick and rolls with CP3 is a lot more. It's one of the top in the leagues, right? So I think having them on the floor offensively together it, or separately, it allows them to utilize that a lot more. And CP3 has learned to play at a different speed before. He played at a different speed when he was in Houston with James Harden. So he can't adapt to being off the ball. Still questions defensively I have for a smaller unit, but I, I think basketball IQ-wise and spacing, they've gotten slightly better. Mm, what do you think, Larry? Yeah, listen, you can't debate whether Chris Paul makes them smarter, better ball control. There's no doubt about those things. And, and he's a great, great player, an all-time great player. Make them a better team. But does it move the needle that much for me? Because I, I'm having a hard time Not understanding much. stylistically Stylistically, how does this work? I mean, Golden State needs to play fast. When they play at a fast pace, that's when they're most effective offensively. It also requires a whole lot of off-the-ball movement from everybody on the team and the ball in the middle of the floor with Draymond Green doing a lot of facilitating. Chris Paul is a traditional point guard. Give me the ball. Let me bring it up. Let me handle it. Let me get a high ball screen. Let me probe and get into the lane and play, you know, drive and kick basketball. That's the way Chris Paul wants to play. That doesn't really fit with the way the Warriors play. I do have some concerns about their size. I thought they were too small last yes, year, yeah. and they got smaller. Mm -hmm. I don't know that that's a great thing because they got thrown around a little bit on the glass with different matchups last year. The youth movement hasn't happened at the level we thought. That was a big one. Kaminga, Moody, Wiseman's not even there anymore. We thought that was the next wave. Hasn't really developed yet. If those guys, Moody and Kaminga particularly, could take a leap forward, I agree that this team's still very much in the championship window because of how Curry looks but they absolutely have to have that added depth with those young players, and it didn't really happen last year. Does this mean they have to re-sign Draymond Green? Oh, critical. Yes. yes, absolutely. If they lose Draymond Green, then I think we're talking, we're having a totally different conversation about this team. Yeah, about the dynasty. Yes, the about their ability the to contend in the West. Yeah. And it, you can't lose them to a team like Sacramento. Mm. Right. Yeah, you, you can't lose them to a team that close to you that's like right there in the rankings and where they are because like, that's the next step in their iteration. I love it. All right, thanks, guys. Oh, listen. Got to remind you, first round of this year's NHL draft is to not James Harden would accept a role like that. He, he, you have to. Mm. You have to. There's no choice. You have to. If, you, if you're not, I can't give you the deal. Mm. I it, think it, you have to set that limit. Mm. That's, that's just really interesting. Um, Tim Legler joins us in here. What do you think? Hooked up behind. What's up, What's going on? <laughs> what do you think when he just said it? Yeah, yeah. no, I, well, I completely agree with it. I, I, look, I understand the tough situation the Sixers are in. Yeah. Right? I mean, you're, you're in the mix in the East to contend. You've got James Harden. 
Right? You don't have a great another option to go acquire talent comparable to James Harden. We know about his struggles in the playoffs. So they have to give him an offer, right? A legitimate offer to try to retain him and roll forward with it. But I completely agree. It is time to see more about what Tyrese Maxey is capable of. Is he legitimately a star or is he a really good third option? Let's find out. And I think that means you've got to give a little bit more control of the offense to Tyrese Maxey because there are too many nights where you watch and Maxey's clearly in the shadows of James Harden. And it, it affects his ability to really, I think, reach his potential right now. So if you roll forward with James Harden three, four years, it, does that mean that's how long it's going to stifle Maxey? So at some point, you've got to start to move in that direction. And that means James Harden with a little bit less control of the offense. I think that'd be the best way to proceed going forward. Nice. Wendy, uh, what's your intel on what Harden's going to do? Is he going to opt in or you think he'll opt out and look uh, at other offers? Yeah, I think it's highly unlikely that he opts in just because, guys, he took a huge pay cut. Uh, it was this eight-figure pay cut last year to move down to $35 million so that they could add players like P.J. Tucker and DeAnthony Melton. So he's going to need to get paid back for that, if nothing else. Uh, so I think he opts out uh, to leave his options open also just to get a raise. But you guys have hit on something that is important here. You know, one of the things that Harden said at the end of the season is that he felt it was a year of sacrifice last year for them, for him. Not just because he took that less money, as I just mentioned, but also because he played a role that was really focused on supporting Joel Embiid. Uh, you know, and Embiid himself said the day he got the MVP trophy that he, he really felt Harden was wholly invested in him getting that award. So one of the big questions you have for James Harden isn't just the you know, amount of money and number of years, it's are you willing to continue to play that role? And what if that role includes some more sacrifice for Tyrese Maxey? And those are part of the conversations that he's been having, I'm sure, with Nick Nurse. Nurse has spoken with him leading up to this contract decision. And, you know, everything has to be in alignment. So it's not just a matter of negotiating that dollar amount, as you guys bring up. You see, Brian, I think there's leverage here for Daryl Morey and the 76ers. And all this talk that's been around Tim Fertitta, owner of the Houston Rockets, we want James Harden back. Realistically and practically, if you're Raphael Stone or if you're M.A. Yudoka, their new head coach, you're going to look at the average age of this team, right, with guys like Jalen Green, 20 years old. Mm -hmm. You're telling me you're going to bring James Harden back for that type of money to lead that locker room culturally at this stage of his career? I'm not sure I'm making that decision. I I'm looking for guys like Fred Van Vliet. I'm even looking for guys like Dylan Brooks, who may poke the bear off the court, but still, he's going to work up, He's going to work hard, play every single day. I know what kind of energy. I, I really think this conversation around who helps steer a lot of the young players for franchises, there's a reason why Udonis Haslam is still on the bench for the Miami Heat, right? Like, that's critical to your culture moving forward for an organization. I'm not sure if I'm Raphael Stone or Emiki uh, Udoka that I actually want to do that to my young core. And so that, that means then if he stays and you bring him back in Philly, it, will it become a distraction because you're trying to get him to play more a more reduced role whereas he's saying no I need to be me I need to be a score if he's being realistic with himself and honest with himself at this stage of his career look he's still a very good highly productive regular season player and he has spotty moments when he's great in the postseason he has other nights when he really struggles if he's being realistic about himself and his real odds and chances of winning a championship he needs to accept some of that and he's going to get his money and he's already got a ton of money. He's going to get the money. But right now, he's in a position, clearly top four in the East. And you've got a lot of questions in Milwaukee with guys that they absolutely yep. have to resign. Or we're going to look at them a little bit differently if they lose a Lopez and a Middleton. Right? Milwaukee, uh, Boston trying to figure out this new look with Porzingis. Right? So you, you're right there firmly in the mix. James Harden wants to actually play deep into the postseason. This is his best chance. But it's going to have to be elevate Tyrese Maxey. That is his best option to actually play on a team that breaks through the second round. All right, let's talk about a team out west. And last week, you know, the Warriors traded for future Hall of Fame point guard Chris Paul in exchange for Jordan Poole, who went to the Wizards. Now, the 38-year-old Paul averaged nearly 14 points, nine assists for the Suns last season. And yesterday, Steph Curry spoke for the first time about the addition of CP3. Every team that CP's been on, you know, they've gotten better. Um, and I think that's the most consistent thing about him and who he is and what he brings to the team. And everybody's going to talk about the age and all that type of stuff. So it's so on us to, to put it all together and figure out how the pieces work 